Good afternoon. I love to compete with lunch. <laughs> so I've been thinking about this opportunity for the last month or so and what sort of speech I would write and so on um, because of the importance of this opportunity. And I decided actually not to write a speech and to just produce an outline to sort of help me with my thinking um, because I think it's much more important for me to come across as extremely genuine in this conversation as opposed to being thorough. And so that's a little bit of a risk for me, so sort of bear with me here. Um, but I hope you'll find uh, the conversation to be worth it. Um, and I assume that if you guys wanted uh, someone to come up here and talk about policing, that you would have bought an expert in policing or someone in uh, criminology or someone who knows policing models. And that's not who I am. And I do know what I do know uh, something about, which is organizational culture, managing people, redemption, transformation, stigma, challenging oneself and challenging others, building leadership, looking at things in a historical context, uh, and providing hope and the value of hope. So I'd like to start out by thanking Director Malekian um, for his own leadership at the COPS office. Um, his career has uh, shown tons of evidence of valor and courage but his uh, leadership now at the COPS office shows tremendous vision and I think an appetite for risk that you don't normally see in government in leadership. And it's something that I appreciate as an advocate, someone who creates a space for himself and his staff to think outside the box and to be extremely innovative, uh, to challenge the norms and to ask the tough questions about what's working, what's not working and where's there room for improvement. Um, and he's supported by uh, very intelligent and committed staff, namely Catherine McQuaid, who I've had the chance to work with, and Zoe Mantel, who I'm sure is somewhere here in this room, and other folks on staff at the COPS office. Uh, the role I've played in conjunction with the COPS office is as part of the National Network for Safe Communities, where the COPS office is working in collaboration with uh, David Kennedy and other folks from John Jay College of Criminal Justice, and there are many police chiefs in that space, um, researchers and policy makers and advocates like myself disguised as service providers. Um, I'm always pleased to have the opportunity to be in that space, although it's always a bit of an awkward space for me, although it shouldn't be. So I've been doing this work for 10 years now as an advocate, as a service provider, working on reentry issues, and it actually amazes me um, the lack of opportunities I have to directly engage law enforcement. So that's another reason today's opportunity is something I wouldn't have missed for the world. Um, and to prove that I had dental surgery three days ago and I'm still standing here. Um, so the last time I had this many people in law enforcement interested in what I had to say, there was an indictment pending. <laughs> and for those of you who missed that joke, you should have Googled me before I got here. Um, but the fact that I am standing here, again, speaks to the courage and commitment of this office and its leadership. So I'd like to contextualize my remarks by telling you a little bit more about myself and a little bit about the agency I work for. Um, I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, Bedford-Stuyvesant. If you know anything about Bedford-Stuyvesant, uh, for a very long time, it was a uh, community that was very impoverished and uh, disproportionately impacted by high crime. Um, I am the product of an interracial couple. My dad is white, uh, my mother's black. My father was a police officer for many years before he retired. Um, I have a brother, an older brother, who's currently a federal correction officer. I grew up in stark poverty uh, in Brooklyn on public assistance. Um, I have a younger brother who was in and out of the criminal justice system for almost his entire life until recently. He seems to have sort of gotten it together. Um, I spent six years in prison myself for robbery. Um, and I've been home for 10 years. Um, so I've been doing this work pretty much from the day I walked out of prison. I was lucky enough to earn a liberal arts degree while I was in prison. And I'll talk a little bit about that because that opportunity has diminished significantly for people in prison. Um, I have advocated to change laws and policies in many states successfully. Um, I have successfully advocated on the federal level for change in policies to remove barriers to reentry facing people with criminal records. I've worked on issues of employment and housing and education and voting rights. Um, I've been blessed to have the opportunity to have company with people like uh, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor and actor Richard Gere and uh, Desmond Tutu and A.G. Holder and a 
and a bunch of other folks who have been influential in my own thinking about the work, uh, but who have shared with me their thoughts about criminal justice in this country. Um, but I also put a lot of equal value on the work I do on the ground. So I make a lot of trips to D.C. I do a lot of really high-end work, working with policymakers and members of Congress and so on. Uh, but to stay grounded, I try to find myself spending just as much time in the communities that are impacted, at the storefront churches in those communities. I happen to live in Harlem, central Harlem, one of the seven communities most impacted by the criminal justice system in New York. Um, so conceivably, I could live anywhere in New York at this point. I do relatively well. Um, but at the same time, I deliberately choose to live in a community where when I walk out of my front door, I am reminded of why I wake up every day and work these long hours and why we all uh, sort of work hard to increase public safety. Um, I sit on the community board in the community, so I'm very aware of the community's thoughts about crime. Um, I'm reminded that even poor communities that lack resources care about public safety and how oftentimes uh, they may not have all of the answers and may not realize it's, that there are more than one way to get to public safety and maybe asking folks like the folks in this room um, for quick solutions to long-term problems. Um, so, so doing the work on the ground really keeps me grounded. Uh, about four and a half years ago, I landed at the Fortune Society. And so I'll talk a little bit about the Fortune Society because I think it'll add additional context to the uh, remarks I'll make toward the end of my presentation. So 46 years ago, there was a play called Fortune in Men's Eyes, and it was written by a gentleman named John Herbert who had done time in prison, and he wrote this play to tell his story of being involved in the criminal justice system um, and his experience in prison and how difficult it was for him to transition back into society. And David Rothenberg, who was a theater agent at the time, uh, for very important people like Elizabeth Taylor and a, a number of other big name stars, recognized this to be an amazing play, although it was a true story, um, including things like the fact that this gentleman was raped while he was in the criminal justice system. And David invested his life savings in this play, $12,000 at the time. And the play went off Broadway, and David ended up on a national show called The David Susskind Show. And if you know it, you don't have to raise your hands because it'll say something about how old you are. Um, but it's a show very similar to The David Letterman Show. And so the next day after being on that show, David shows up at his office in Midtown Manhattan in the theater district. And there's about 60 people waiting on a winding staircase for him. And they, mostly people who had been involved in the criminal justice system saying, I saw you on television last night. I heard about your play. I really want to get my life together. But here are the barriers that I'm facing. Can you help me? And David, uh, being the extremely intelligent person that he is, recognized that he really knew nothing about the criminal justice system. And he asked two of the men online to serve as volunteers to, in turn, help the other folks online. And that was the beginning of the Fortune Society 46 years ago as a volunteer self-help advocacy organization. So if you fast forward four and a half decades to where we are today, uh, a third of our board is formally incarcerated. That's very deliberate. Our bylaws require that. Uh, we have 170 people on staff, half of them are formally incarcerated, as I said in the beginning, present company included. Um, and that's a huge part of what works at Fortune, and I'm going to talk a bit about what works. Um, we occupy 65,000 square feet of program space in Long Island City, New York, and we have another 20,000 square feet of program space in Harlem. Uh, we provide an array of programs that have all been constructed around the needs of people who have been involved in the criminal justice system. So basic education up to GED. We have a program that also helps people to get into college and navigate the college process. We have an employment program that does what's called soft skills training, the idea of showing up to work on time, dressing properly, how do you deal with workplace problems, and so on. And then hard skills training, because with the economy being what it is, we found that soft skills training, although we had done it for three, four decades, just really wasn't enough for our folks to be competitive in a labor market where, unfortunately, they're coming up against people who have PhDs and master's degrees that are competing pretty much for the same job. We always say our folks are in the, in the back of the line when you think about employment, and in 2008, the line just got that much longer. And so the question is, how do we better prepare our folks for employment? Because the statistics do say that 83% of people who are violated at unemp are unemployed at the time of violation on parole or probation. So there's a, there's a huge correlation between employment 
and reduce recidivism, employment and self-esteem, employment and health benefits, and all these other things um, that are tied to inextricably to employment. We have a family services program um, because a lot of people lose connections with their family while they're incarcerated. And to be quite honest, we'll never have the resources it takes to serve the 700,000 people coming home from prison nationally every year or the 25,000 leaving state prison in New York uh, coming back to New York City or the 108,000 admissions that we see on Rikers Island each year, the second largest jail in the United States. Um, we have drug and alcohol treatment, mental health services. Um, probably more importantly, out of the 3,000 people we see per year, we do alternatives to incarceration. So we work on both sides of the system. We work on helping people who are coming out of the system, and that's about 2,500 people. And then we have about 500 mostly young folks where we have a presence in the courts, and we work with the judges and with the prosecutor and defense attorney um, to identify people who would be better served in the community where there's no diminishing of public safety. So the idea is trying to get people engaged in a rigorous program that gives them education, employment, and those sorts of things, keeps them out of prison, and hopefully if they're successful, they get a non-incarcerative sentence. Um, but we very much recognize um, that there is the opportunity for people to fail in the program and end up right back in prison. Um, that's why we're very careful to target people who are actually facing a year or more in jail or prison, because we don't want to engage in what's called net widening, pulling a person out of the system, having them fail, and then suddenly they are facing prison time. But we've done it for three and a half decades. Uh, we've sort of figured out how to make it work. A big part of it is that we have a prosecutor running the program, a former prosecutor. And so that helps us to do a better job of gauging who is really uh, on a track to go to jail or prison. Um, we also do housing. So in 2002, we recognized that as much as our clients were trying to get their lives together and stabilize and engage in treatment, that the lack of stable and affordable housing was derailing that process. And so we purchased a piece of property in Harlem, uh, affectionately referred to as the castle. It is a beautiful Gothic structure. It looks like a castle and houses 62 people who are formerly incarcerated at any given point and provides them transitional housing and slowly moves them out into the community, into uh, uh, self-sustainability. Um, we do drug and alcohol screening on a daily basis and so on. But more importantly, even though there's no waiting, if, even though there's no period of time that they can be at the castle, you find that people recognize ultimately that it's such an amazing opportunity um, that they make space for the person coming behind them. And so, so don't lose sight of some of the words, please. Hope and opportunity. Um, in fact, when people talk about my story, they say, well, Glenn, you must, be, you must be the exception, right? I mean, who goes from six years in prison for robbery to where you are today? And I always remind people that I'm not exceptional. I was just exposed to exceptional opportunities. And hopefully I can uh, show you evidence of that throughout my presentation. Um, someone instilled hope in me, and I'll give you an evidence of that. And a lot of people created opportunity for me. And it didn't always mean months and months or years and years of interaction with me. Sometimes the interaction um, was as uh, short as the time it takes to, for instance, stop and frisk a person. Right? So I'm going to give you evidence of that, hopefully, before I finish. Um, so a little bit about who our clients are, because I think that um, people have their own perception of what people look like who are involved in the criminal justice system. Um, a lot of our folks, you know, if you think about communities that are impacted by crime, heavily impacted by crime, then you're probably talking about the same communities that are heavily impacted by victimization, because most people commit crimes right in the communities where they live. I think one difference is that most of the people in this community don't have access to the health care resources and mental health resources to deal with the trauma of being the victim of crime or a person who witnesses uh, violent crime. And all the evidence points to the fact that unaddressed trauma manifests itself in uh, uh, violent behavior, offense, uh, the person who is the victim becoming the offender. Um, and so we constantly recognize that at Fortune, that the majority of people who walk through our door are at some point in their lives the victim of crime. Although we recognize that they've also committed a crime, we don't lose sight of the fact that there is trauma there that needs to be dealt with. Uh, they come from high crime neighborhoods, high poverty neighborhoods. Many of them have dealt with multiple incarcerations. 
low education. I'm a firm believer that a lot of the people who end up in the criminal justice system in the United States are the product of our failed educational policies, and that is clearly evident from the people who come through the door at the Fortune Society. Many of them are saddled with debt. We are moving in the direction of creating a lot of statutes that create mandatory fines and fees for people involved in the criminal justice system. But if you couple that with the fact that the majority of people in the criminal justice system are poor, what you end up with, unfortunately, although it feels really good to say these people are going to sort of pay for their crime and to be tough, you actually end up with people who are in a bit of a debtor's prison, even after they're released from prison and trying to get their lives back together. And if you know anything about employment these days, employers do not only do background checks, which 80% of large employers do, do and 40 to 60% of medium employers do, but they also do credit checks. So it's just another sort of strike against our clients dealing with the liens that result as a res uh, that result from not paying the fines and fees that they accumulate. Uh, many of them are addicted. They come through the door with what we call the prison face. So all of the behaviors that people adopt to be able to survive in prison are mostly the same behaviors that will allow them to fail in society. And so think about it, if you're in prison, um, the, the idea of sort of being soft doesn't work, right? The idea of building relationships is, is, uh, has a negative connotation to it. And so people come through the door with all of these defense mechanisms that take a while for them to sort of uh, ease away from. When I think about the castle where we house people, even if I've not been to the castle for months and I'm not sure exactly who's living there at that time, if I just walk through the living quarters and take a look at the lockers, because we give everyone a lock for their locker, um, I can tell who just got there and who's been there the longest, because the people who just got there, everything is locked. And the people who've been there the longest have recognized that they don't need the locks, that it's a safe environment, that they don't have to be so defensive. But it takes a while for people to get rid of the prison face. 98% uh, of the people who come through the door are people of color, 88% are men. Many of them have a lack of trust for government. So it's not just law enforcement, it's many in all branches of government, if you will. Many have been involved in um, the court system, the family court system, administration for children's services, and so on, all throughout their lives, and have gained a mistrust for government more generally. Um, Many are learning individual responsibility for the first time. Um, but the majority of them come through the door with a desire to change. And we try to recognize that at Fortune, that just the fact that they show up at our front door really says a lot. To get a person who's been committing crime for many, many years throughout their lives to show up at the door of a place like the Fortune Society says a lot about their thinking process and what got them to the, to the door. And even the people who are mandated to Fortune were very clear at Fortune about not holding the hammer over a person's head as the way to get them to do the right thing. They know it's there. We're talking about folks who their entire lives have had the hammer held over their heads. So what we tell people actually, even the people who are mandated there by judges and facing time if they don't do well, is that you still have a choice. And it's something they're not used to being told, that you have a choice, that you know what the penalties are for not being here, but still, you have a choice. You do not have to be here, and when you're walking down the door and the hall and you might be cursing and your pants may be hanging down and you have your hat on, we're not going to say, take that hat off, or I'll tell the judge and you'll get locked up, because they're used to hearing that. And there's other things that we do to get them to respond. And so a correction officer visited me at the Fortune Society a couple of weeks ago, shortly after I visited Rikers Island, and he said, why? He said, what are you guys doing different than what we're doing? He said, these are the same folks who were in Rikers a couple of weeks ago. They're in gangs. They're fighting each other. They're cutting each other. What are you guys doing differently? So I gave some thought to that for today's presentation. And, and some of the things that we do, number one, respect. Uh, every new staff member that comes through the door at Fortune goes through our new employee breakfast. And I think the strongest message at that one hour breakfast is when we wrap up and we say to people, you need to treat everyone who walks through the door at the Fortune Society the way you would want your family member treated if they walk through the door at the Fortune Society. That's number one. Number two, we have an extremely low threshold for services. Unfortunately, a lot of service providers are very driven by their contracts. And so when people come through the door, there's questions about how long have you been sober? Are you HIV positive? Um, do you have a mental health issue? All these sorts of things that, you know, we're a bit bound by with our contracts, but we have recognized that that is not what works about our model. So every single person who walks through the door at Fortune gets services, whether we have a contract that fits their needs or not. So very low threshold for services. Um, no exclusion based on criminal record. 
So we do not only serve nonviolent offenders. We do, we do not exclude sex offenders. We do not exclude people with some of the most serious convictions. In fact, because we have limited resources, we actually target people with the most serious convictions. So if you look at the castle, uh, the housing that I mentioned, most of the people who live there have done 20 or more years in prison. And obviously, to do 20 or more years in prison, you either have a serious drug conviction under the, Rockefeller, the former Rockefeller drug laws, or uh, you have a manslaughter or murder conviction. Um, but our experience is that those people become the anchor of that community, and that people change, and those people change, and we've seen evidence of them change, and we should be targeting our resources where we can have the most impact. The other thing is cultural competency, half the agency being formally incarcerated. I cannot tell you how that plays out in terms of a very organic mentoring model developing. Um, for instance, people walk by my office. Um, I have one of the larger offices in the facility is in an area where the executive row is, if you will, but very deliberately we made all of those offices of glass so that they're very inviting, so that clients don't feel intimidating about looking into the office or speaking to someone in the office. And it never fails. Every couple of weeks I get a client who's on that row and he looks into my office and he might be reading some of the things on the wall and so on and I call him in and I start the conversation with him and you can just see that he's a bit disconnected, like who is this lawyer guy trying to tell me what to do. And then halfway through the conversation, when I tell him that I did time in prison and that just 10 years ago I was sitting where he's sitting, how the conversation changes and how suddenly that person is visiting my office every week until they successfully complete the program. So cultural competency um, is extremely important. And I think when we think about law enforcement, I think we should be thinking about cultural competency. And cultural competency um, for us doesn't just mean you've done time in prison. That's not enough. It means that you know something about the population that when you see certain behaviors, um, that you create a space to think really deeply about what those behaviors mean and that you don't suddenly attach um, thoughts to that behavior that may not be accurate. Um, i never forget doing an employer study many years ago where this employer who was in a focus group said, you know, I don't hire guys who wear saggy pants because saggy pants means that they're into hip hop and if they're into hip hop, they're into violence and if they're into violence, they're probably selling drugs and I don't want that in my place of employment. And just watching how going from saggy pants all the way down that road um, reminds me of the value uh, of the cultural competency that we have at the Fortune Society, so much so that we wrote a toolkit on it called Employing Your Mission, and we were lucky enough to have Attorney General Holder actually help us launch that particular toolkit, and it's for other agencies to see more value in hiring their clients. Um, we prioritize people who fail in our program. If you know anything about people involved in the criminal justice system, you pretty much know they rarely ever get it right the first time. So when people talk about my story, um, many people make the assumption like, oh, he did one thing wrong and he went to prison, he did six years and he came out and he changed his life. Like everyone else who ends up in prison with a six year gig, pretty much there was a lot that preceded that, right? There was a lot of interaction with the criminal justice system that sort of led up to that, uh, uh, that sentence. And so, and so what we recognize at Fortune is that people don't go from committing crime and doing drugs and those sort of things to doing the right thing. It's not very linear. It actually looks a lot like this. And so you have to make space for the fact that people end up out here. And when they come back, you have to create a space to reinvite them. So if a person gets kicked out of our program, even for violent behavior, which is the one thing we don't tolerate, we have zero tolerance for violent behavior, the truth is that when they come back, we will create a space for that person because we know it works. Some of our most successful stories are people who've been involved in the criminal justice system 15, 20, 25 times, and then when they finally figured it out and they needed help, they remembered how inviting Fortune was. Even when they were coming to Fortune just to play us, just to get the Metro card to sell it and go get drugs, when they finally hit rock bottom and they're ready to turn their lives around, they know that we've created a space for them to come back, and it works. It's a big part of what works at the Fortune Society. Um, we treat people with dignity, even if they don't see it when they walk through the door, they don't see themselves in the future. We help them to see themselves in the future. I can't tell you how many people walk through our door and have no sense of what their life is gonna look like two, three months from now, much less a year or two or three years. We actually have a program where we help people do gardening. And the idea is that if you plant a seed, you have to be around to see that seed flourish into something later on as a way to get clients to think of themselves in the future. Um, we have a program at Fortune for people on staff, 
everyone, but we know that, so the idea is if you put a dollar into your retirement, the agency matches it with like $150, huge incentive. And the people who are formerly incarcerated who are on staff rarely take the agency up on it. And a big part of it is that they have been trained to not think about themselves many, many years in the future. And the question is, how do you move people away from that? And you know, you always talk about people in the criminal justice system being involved in immediate gratification. Well, guess what? That becomes a behavior that, that is habitual that you end up thinking about everything in the short term. And the question is, how do you break people out of that? And we spend a lot of time working on that at the Fortune Society. But we're also still very much an advocacy organization. And it's the reason I came to Fortune to help launch the David Rothenberg Center for Public Policy. And what we do there is we work on the systemic issues that affect our clients. And so it's easy to say that our clients need to have individual responsibility, but there has to be a recognition that not everyone has the same opportunities uh, to engage in individual responsibility. And a lot of that breaks down along lines of race and class. And so we work on issues of so as you think about mass incarceration in the United States, um, I think for some people the assumption is that we've sort of been locking people up at the same rate forever, when the truth is that it's been pretty linear, and then you have the end of the civil rights era, and you have this huge spike in incarceration in the United States. And you have not just incarceration, but what's called collateral consequences. The idea that if you have a criminal record, you can't work here. You can't vote here. You can't get a job here. You can't get certification here. You cannot get financial aid here. Um, you cannot get public assistance here. And it's prevalent. Over the last 40 years, in, in our attempt to be extremely tough on crime, we have created uh, a self-fulfilling prophecy of people cycling back into the criminal justice system repeatedly because even the people who come out with all intention of doing the right thing find themselves up against insurmountable barriers. I came out of prison with an associate's degree. I came out of prison gung-ho to do the right thing. I had housing stability. I had uh, contacts. Um, I'm someone well-spoken, I'd like to think. And I visited 35 different employers most of which denied me on the spot because of the felony conviction. And the ones who did hire me, most of the time, by the time I got home, had either recognized that they didn't look closely enough at the application or that they might have had a conversation with someone else at the organization and rescinded the offer. 35 different employers in about a month's period. And so our clients, unfortunately, when they are faced with that experience, referred back to the behavior that they're used to and find themselves right back in the criminal justice system. Very self-fulfilling uh, prophecy, if you will. So some of the issues we worked on. So recently, I've spent a lot of time here in DC working with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission to pass a directive that tells employers nationally that you cannot have a blanket policy of denying employment based solely on a criminal record because there's so many people of color involved in the criminal justice system that that, that, that policy ends up violating Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. So we're proud of that work. Uh, we work on issues of uh, Pell Grants. So people in prison back in 1994 were denied access to federal grants and loans to go to college, and it meant that systemic college in prison in the United States was re removed in 1994 and really has not returned at the level that it was uh, prior to it. And obviously, as a recipient, of a college education. I put huge value in providing education to people in prison. Voting rights. Uh, states differ in whether or not they give voting rights back to people in prison. You want to figure out a way to get people to reoffend, marginalize them, make them feel as though they're not part of the social contract. And taking away a person's right to vote, that is one of the best ways to do that. Our clients always say to me, you know, maybe, my, maybe voting is not important. Maybe it's not an important thing for me to do anyhow. And I always say to them, if it's not important, why would they take it away from you? Like, there has to be value in it. And so part of it is getting people to recognize the value of the vote, but that applies across America. I don't think that's just people involved in the criminal justice system. But one thing I do know, that it is really easy to commit crime when you think nobody gives a damn when you think no one is watching, when you think you're not part of the system. And at sentencing, 
you know, we have this whole procedure where we take away people's rights and we sort of knock them down a couple notches and we put them in prison and we tell them they all these things that they cannot do. And think about it, we have no equal ceremony to bring people back up post-incarceration. So we leave people with that reminder that you have committed a crime, you have violated the social contract, and there's almost no way for you to get back here. And voting is so inextricably tied to that feeling. Um, we're working on replicating our housing upstate New York with a grant from New York State. And one of the other things we're working on is policing issues, um, namely uh, stop and frisk. Anyone here from New York? Huh, okay, I think I can make it to that door before you make it to me. <laughs> I'll be kind, I'll be kind, I promise. So we work on issues of stop and frisk. So I don't want to spend time debating stop and frisk and whether it works. Um, if you want to know my position on it, look at my Twitter page. Um, I mean, first of all, at the Fortune Society, one thing people value about us, you know, uh, Denise O'Donnell, Director O'Donnell is here in the audience when she was at the Division of Criminal Justice Services in New York and served as the Secretary of Public Safety. Um, I'd like to think that we were one of her partners in the work that she was doing to increase public safety. And that's, that's part of our strategy at Fortune, is that it really does take a village to get this right. And so we work extremely closely with government, including law enforcement, including NYPD. I like the opportunity to be able to pick up the phone and say to Commissioner Kelly or, or one of his deputies that we have a client that we think was unfairly treated and we'd like for you or someone to take a look at it. And, and, and I'm happy that we have that access. And I'm happy that we're able to propose pilot projects to uh, NYPD and have them give it serious consideration. At the same time, we're, we're critical about stop and frisk and how it impacts our clients, and, and, and I'm sensitive to the tough job of law enforcement. In many ways, you're asked to solve cancer, and then we stick you in the emergency room and say, wait for the bodies to come in, right? Your job is extremely tough. You're in neighborhoods that are mired in poverty with social problems and failed policies, and you're sort of at the end of the game, if you will, and asked to solve many of those problems. But that's not to say there's a role that you can't play. That's just to say that you know, the impact of over-policing and over-enforcement and mass incarceration and collateral consequences, some of the things I spoke about, all play into this existing community dialogue about the role of law enforcement in the lives of poor people of color, right? So that's not an indictment of law enforcement. That's just the reality of some of these communities that when they think about law enforcement, they're thinking about law enforcement is ingrained in this lifelong conversation about racism and classism and oppression. And, and you have people who live in these communities who, who lived through Jim Crow or learned about it from their parents, who, who were active in the civil rights era and the fight for equal rights, um, and who are now living through mass incarceration and the collateral consequences that stem from it. And, and have recognized that unfortunately increasingly in the United States, criminal record-based discrimination serves as a surrogate for race-based discrimination. And that's a reality for these communities. The fact that if an employer says, I don't hire anyone with a felony, that we know that one in three black men are gonna have a felony before the age of 24, I think it is. And so what does that mean? How does that policy translate? Whether you mean it or not, whether that is your goal and your purpose or not, your goal could be just uh, public safety, safety in the workplace, safety of other staff members and so on, but we have to continue to remind ourselves that the way these things play out, play right into the community's dialogue. I was lucky enough to be involved in a study with Princeton University a few years ago called Discrimination in Low-Wage Labor Markets, and we hired 13 young men, white, black, and Latino, to go out into the New York City entry-level labor market and apply for jobs posing as if they have a criminal record on teams. So you'd send out two blacks, two whites, white, black, Latino, to apply for these jobs and then come back to the office and talk about what experiences they had and whether it was a positive outcome, as in they got the job or they got a call back from the employer. And I'll never forget uh, the black tester coming back repeatedly saying, oh, there was no job, they had already given away the job. And then the Latino tester comes back and he says the same thing, sorry, the job's already taken. And then the white tester comes back at the end of the day and say, I got the job. And they just sat there and say, what do you mean you got the job? There is no job. 
And he's like, no, I got the job. Look, here's evidence. I got the job. And it happened repeatedly. We did 3,500 visits. And so the outcome of the study was that a white person with a criminal record has a better chance of getting a job than a black person who's equally qualified who's never had handcuffs on ever. Right? And then when you look at the outcomes of the job seeker with the criminal record, the black one, his callbacks are reduced another 57%. So communities internalize this. In fact, when I went back to my community, Harlem, and talked about the study, you know, people were like, yeah, no blank, right? Yeah, <laughs> like, that's surprising to you? Um, so, so, you so, so your officers, um, your staff are sort of working in this context, and I think we all have to at the least recognize it, not ignore it, um, recognize that, um, and not allow racism I don't think racism is prevalent in law enforcement, but I think like any other system, it can seep into the system. I think we have to be vigilant about weeding it out, and I think we have to have the same sort of zero tolerance for it within law enforcement that we do, um, that we take in law enforcement about other things. Um, because police legitimacy matters, um, be because, <laughs> nothing like being told how many minutes you have left. Um, <laughs> Uh, because police legitimacy matters, because procedural justice matters. Another story, uh, when I moved to Harlem, I remember being pulled over by a police officer, got out of the car before he really had a chance to approach me. He approached me, he asked for ID, he said, why are you here, why are you parked here, let me see your ID. He ran the ID and so on. He came back, he gave it to me, he said, had a nice day. You know, in my head, I was like, that was just some racist crap, right? Nice car, black guy, that's the only reason he stopped me. I decided to ask him why he stopped me, which most people don't do. And he said, I'm stopping you because this is an area where a lot of people pull over to solicit prostitution. And you know, you talk about like being in a boat and bumping into another boat and being ready to curse the person out and find out the other boat is empty. Like that was the feeling, right? <laughs> like I was just all set to let this guy have it, but when he explained to me why he stopped me, all of that dissipated. And it was my reality just a couple of minutes ago. And then suddenly it wasn't. And suddenly there was another reason for why this person stopped me. Um, similarly, I was sitting in a barber shop yesterday, and I was talking to the other barbers about coming here today and about what they thought I should talk about. And one told this story about gentrification in Harlem. Harlem is changing. It used to be mostly black neighborhood. Now it's extremely gentrified. And so things are changing, more stores, more restaurants. The parks are beautiful. And he talked about being in a park and how they put all of this new equipment in the park. But they also created all these new rules about the park, where you can be in the park, criminalization of behavior. If you don't have a child, you can get a, a, a fine for being in the park and so on. And he was in the park playing ball on Saturday with his family, and he saw the police officers come over close to dusk, and they started using the plastic flex cuffs to, to close certain parts of the park up, right, the gates in the park. And he defined that as, you know, he said, look at that. He said, that was, he said that's one step short of martial law. Clearly, that's the direction we're heading in in Harlem, is martial law. And, and, and if you look below 96th Street and you look in Central Park, they would never dare to do that. And some parts of that story are, are true, and some part of it are just false, right? But it's his reality, it's many people's reality in the community. And the question is, how do you do your work uh, inside of that reality? And when I talk to people, and I don't think that's easy. I don't think that's easy. It's not easy at the Fortune Society. I know it's not easy in law enforcement. And I'm looking at a generation of law enforcement leadership that is probably struggling with, you know, how do we watch the data and keep crime down with how do we recognize that if we do so much damage that people are not calling the police so that there is no data to watch, then it means that some section of society is more safe while there are others that are not as safe. Um, and I recognize that challenge. Um, and I also see how the community's behavior towards law enforcement can easily be translated into apathy. You know, you hear the community complain over and over, we don't want stop and frisk, but at the same time we want you to reduce crime. Um, I've heard people refer to stop and frisk as fishing with a machine gun, the idea that you're destroying the community. You're going to catch the fish, you're going to destroy the community. And I could see how if I were in law enforcement I could easily translate that uh, to be apathy from the community. But what I know, being on Community Board 10, being engaged with local churches and so on, is that people in these communities want to increase public safety. So, so turning back to our clients and how they're impacted by over enforcement and stop and frisk, these are folks who at a time in their lives are looking to create an identity, to reinvent themselves, 
to undo years of behavior, um, habitual behavior. And the message to them is that, unfortunately, that we don't value them, that we don't put a lot of worth in them, a lot of trust in them. It marginalizes them, it disconnects them. Um, and then couple that with the collateral consequences, um, it really unfortunately sends a message that's the, opposite, that's the opposite of the message we're trying to send people who are trying to uh, reintegrate into community. So, so what can law enforcement do? So I'm gonna tell two quick stories. I think I have six minutes left, so I think I could do it in six minutes. I'm gonna tell two stories about law enforcement. It's not about policing, it's about corrections. Um, but I think there are some similarities there. There's paramilitary organization, language is very important to them about how they uh, engage people. They draw thick lines between themselves and the offender and so on. Um, they have a certain culture, a certain way of doing things. So two stories, one pretty negative, one positive. Um, when I was leaving prison, it was about a week before I left, and I had been in the same institution for the entire time, because when you're going to college in prison, there's not many college programs, so you luckily have the, the opportunity to stay in the prison for the time that you're there. And so you develop a relationship with the correction officers, whether you like it or not, right? You don't want to be known as a person who's too close to correction, but it's just natural, it's human nature. And on the way out, I was talking to the correction officer about leaving and all my hopes and dreams and goals, and in the middle of the conversation, he said, he said, you know, you being here helped me get my boat, and when your son gets here, it's gonna help my son get his boat. It was hard to hear, it was hugely impactful, it shaped the way I do the work going forward, but it was a very short interaction, two, three minutes. Another two, three minute story about a correction officer. When I was coming into the system, there was a correction officer who worked in the uh, receiving facility in New York, and he was in the room where people were being tested to determine which facility they would go to. And he looked down at my grades and he said, wow, look at those grades. He said, you should go to college. He said, in fact, I can see what I can do to get you to one of the uh, prisons that have a college program. And so when people ask me, like, what changed your life, I usually start out by saying, oh, education. And that is a big part of it. But probably equally as important was the fact that a person in a position of authority a person I respected, a person who didn't have to pay a lot of attention outside of his own job description, took the time to tell me that I could be better than I was, right? Even better than I envisioned myself. And it didn't take any longer than it takes to stop and frisk a person. So if we're gonna do these like large scale stops and frisks, and if we're gonna be thinking about how do we watch the numbers and have that be the measurement, the question is how do we create quality engagements between law enforcement and people so that you have an impact that takes a person from sticking up jewelry stores for a living to helping to change people's lives every day for 10 years? Because that's my story. And, and the narrative has changed so considerable, considerably for me as a result of education and someone in a position of authority taking the time to see value in me. And as law enforcement leaders around the country, I hope that as you think of how to develop policy in your own jurisdictions and how do you change culture and how do you motivate your staff to do things a bit differently while at the same time watching what matters, you recognize that even in the short interaction that law enforcement has with these communities that you can change lives. And even though you're sort of uh, in a difficult situation at the end of the line and dealing with all these other things that brought people to the table and got them to the point of committing crime, you just cannot give up on people. If you look at my rap sheet, it would have been easy to give up on me. Everything about my rap sheet says that I should not be standing here in front of you today. And so the reason I'm here today and the reason, no matter what would have happened over the last week, even with the dental surgery and so on, um, you know, all the text messages I sent today and emails and the tweeting I did today was all about this being one of the largest opportunities I've had in my entire career, in the entire 10 years I've been doing this work. Because in the end, law enforcement is the feeder into the criminal justice system. There's some level of discretion uh, when law enforcement engages people in the street where, where the rubber hits the road. And so there's huge opportunities, opportunities to turn people's lives around. And so the things I want you to think about as you walk away from this today is uh, helping, t is that hope matters, that uh, people have dreams and desires just like everyone else in this room, and that we're all much more alike than we are different. Thank you for the opportunity.